Well, we've had a wonderful beginning, haven't we? It's been such a, a great time to see God reminding us of our opportunity to love others in his name. We're so thankful for that. It's our joy tonight to have a very special guy with us here, Peter Bregan, who uh, became a friend of mine about 15 years ago, I think it was, Peter, something like that, where he spoke at one of the early conferences that IABC had. And people asked me why I invited a Jewish psychiatrist to come and speak at a biblical counseling conference. And I said, he's not coming to do theology. He's coming to teach us why psychiatry, psychology are, are so dangerous, why psychotropic drugs are so very dangerous. And so we got in touch with one another again just recently. And uh, through uh, Daniel Berger, and uh, we touched bases once again, and I called Peter and said, Peter, would you consider coming to our conference this year? And he agreed to do so. And uh, he has just become a dear personal friend of mine, and I'm delighted, Peter, to have you come and share with us tonight. Welcome, Peter Bregan, as he comes to share with us tonight, won't you? Peter, it's, oh, can you? You better believe you can. <laughs> such a delight to have you here with us. I mean, uh, you are such a blessing to us, and I know that there are many who, who wonder when we're sharing with them about the fact that God's Word is so powerful. There are people wondering, well, what about you know, psychiatry and psychology? And I'll never forget something you said 15 years ago when we had pastors sitting in front of you. You may not remember this, but you said to them, you looked out and you said, why are you pastors turning to psychology when you already have the only thing that's been proven to change lives, meaning the Bible? And I thank you for that. God bless you as you share with us tonight. Hi. I, I want to thank Daniel, too, for reconnecting uh, me to Ed. And... Um, and uh, it's, just, it's just been very, very moving to be here. On the way um, in the airport on Thursday, I, um, I got food poisoning. <laughs> and I came in limping uh, emotionally and even a little physically. And uh, Kevin picked me up at the um, airport. Um, and I was so befuddled at the time I had walked the whole distance without taking the train through the Denver airport. <laughs> and um, then I met uh, Kevin for the first time, um, and everything got better. Um, I wasn't cured physically, but he never said he was going to do that. Um, and then I went and... Uh, and reconnected with Ed and for the first time in a long time in Marlow and um, uh, being, being a little under the weather and obviously so I, 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 in fact I want to thank the, the wonderful physician here who, who told me I was sick because it was a great reassurance for me to have, have it from the emergency room doc himself that, uh, that I was legitimately not well um, Marlo has, has fussed and worried over me so much that um, Ginger didn't have, my wife didn't have to worry about me one bit. She, uh, she relaxed at home. Um, the reason I have a chair here, there are two reasons. One, because I am recovering and doing well with it. And the other is I'm 82 years old, so sometimes I get a little tired. That's the one thing I've noticed um, over all those many years. I want to start out um, thinking about um, the complexity of the human brain because uh, psychiatric drugs we put directly into the human brain. Uh, every one of them is tailored to cross all the protections that have been placed around our brain to keep out uh, injurious substances. The brain is so complicated that 
probably no one here can name a single neuroscientist of any great importance. There's nobody like Einstein for the brain, nobody like Newton. I think we'd have to get back to Galileo maybe or earlier to find somebody um, tiptoeing on the edges of understanding the brain the way we now have gained so much knowledge about the universe. So one of the, the first things to think about when thinking about the brain is um, why in the world would you think that a foreign substance that the brain has been trying to protect itself against would be helpful? What are the odds that it would be helpful? And as I talk to you about this, you'll discover that the intention was never to help the brain, really. And that's going to be odd, and it's going to be a dilemma, and it's going to raise again for me those questions of human evil that are, remain quite beyond me in so many, many ways. Um, the brain has uh, my estimated 100 billion neurons in it. Some of them have 10,000 connections. Uh, some of them are tiny connections, some run down the spinal cord, and that's just the neurons. Now we know that the support cells, they're called glial cells, which uh, number perhaps between one and ten times the neurons. I mean, that's how little we know, somewhere between one and ten times. And they too participate in this whole process with the neurons, and then with all kinds of chemicals that are swilling around in the brain, and all kinds of uh, hormones and, and uh, you know, you, you've all probably heard of serotonin because it became a sort of a talking point for the politics of the drug companies, you know, this uh, making believe that one, one particular chemical in the brain might cause depression or violence or something else. Or, uh, it's all made up. Anytime anybody tells you that they have something to help your brain, uh, they're just selling something. We, we don't know enough about the brain to, to go about helping it other than by supporting the whole body and supporting ourselves emotionally and spiritually. Uh, there are no fixes uh, for the brain. It's so way beyond us. Um, the whole biochemical imbalance theory, it's not really even a theory. I, I was so glad to see that the uh, that the uh, brochures put out um, for biblical counseling um, make clear that it's just a theory, but it would be better, especially after my, I've been listening to a great deal of conference, it would be better just call it a fraud, a, law, a dishonesty, an untruth. It's not a theory. It was a selling point invented by the PR department of the Eli Lilly when it was making Prozac. It, it wasn't discovered in the labs of Eli Lilly. They didn't discover anything except how to make something, which we'll see, was calculated to poison the brain of rats and other animals and then to be given to humans. I want to take a brief divergence. I've been warned. I just noticed I got warned by Ed not to go into theology. <laughs> I don't blame him. Um, I, I have, I, just to let you know, you deserve to know a little bit more about me than he said. I mean, I deeply believe in God. I don't believe I would be alive today after going up, as I have been doing now for decades, the drug companies, the government, and so on. So I really believe that um, I've been blessed and, uh, and having this opportunity to do this work my whole life. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a... I, I just found out yesterday that uh, there's a phrase in the Bible about work through love. And I've gradually learned over the years to, to work through love, to always work through love as best I can. Um, and um, I'm not a Christian. Um, I think I, I sort of put my hand and in, in my head and uh, my heart or my soul into Ed's hands a little bit and also went to Kevin's and said, well, bring me a little closer to God. Help me a little bit. Um, in fact, I wrote a whole draft of this speech. I never write drafts of speeches anymore. 
never. But I wrote a whole draft of the speech, and then I realized it wasn't for you at all. It was me still wrestling <laughs> with what I think about all these, these enormous issues about, the, about the life and God. One thing I'm sure about in terms of uh, <clears throat> a shared, I think it's a shared belief. I'm not sure anyone has quite put it into words before. And that is that all, everything we call a, a mental disorder, uh, everything we call a psychological disorder, an emotional disorder, they are all, they are all failures in love. Every single one of them. And I want to address this uh, to two biblical counselors. Because while, and I've checked this out with Ed to make sure that I was okay and being consistent, because I really do love being here. I want to get called back. Um, that um, the relationship that you have with your client, um, what I've heard so much about of uh, walk, walking as Jesus would walk, trying to walk as Jesus would walk, as God would want us to walk. It is your love for the person you are talking to that is going to be one of the single most important healing aspects. Um, I deal with, by the way, I never give drugs to people. I've, I've been in practice since, what was that, 1964, I think, something like that. Long, long time. I've never started a patient on a psychiatric drug. I always use them, if at all, to help them come off, to wean off of the drugs. And I work with very disturbed human beings. I work with people brought right out of the hospital, medical center in Ithaca, New York, and uh, who've gone back up to Cornell or some um, other university or hospital, and they've been told now they have to stay on drugs for the rest of their lives, and it so upsets their parents who, uh, that, uh, that they bring them to me as a last resort. I do a lot of last resort seeing of people. And uh, so I work with very distressed human beings. I work with people who have a room filled with hallucinations um, and have terrible delusions and terrible fears, which means that they've been horribly abused in some way or another in order to get into that state. And what I have found contrary to everything taught by the medical profession, is that if I can help that human being in a few minutes or half an hour um, feel that I'm actually caring about them and interested in them, and that I come from a loving viewpoint, not necessarily just toward them, but that that's clearly, hopefully, where I'm coming from, and from a respectful viewpoint, um, they may, for a time, completely stop hallucinating. So, now, that's not the end of it. P people who get into a terrible state, I'm talking about people who are very, very disordered, they may be brought in by their family because they can't come in themselves. They're not going to be cured overnight by me, maybe by God's intervention, but not by me but they will begin the process of regaining a belief in love, in human relationship. Human relationship is about love. All breakdowns in human beings, separating the issue from, from God temporarily, are breakdowns in the relationships be among us and between us. It's as simple as that. And all, you know, what I do is I work a lot with the, about those relationships. And most of my clients are not religious. I live in a very progressive left-wing university town. And uh, I do re tell every one of them that I believe in God and that God's very healing. And um, would, they, would they let me help them in that way? And, and not many do. The only ones who seem to do are, are people who are already deeply religious but who have been separated from their religion by psychiatry. And they, when they hear a psychiatrist who tells them, let's talk about God's love, because if you feel loved by God, you're going to be better. And then if you love God, you're going to be better. And if you redeem this relationship with your wife or your 
children or whoever it is, your husband, uh, you're going to be better. It's about love. It's about healing love, opening our hearts to love. So <clears throat> what I want to encourage you as um, biblical counselors to do is to remember you are an instrument of love, of God, of Jesus in your terms. In my terms, too, because I've learned much more from Jesus than I have from my Hebrew upbringing or, my, or the Old Testament. Um, I can even quote verse with my Christian clients. I wouldn't dare with anybody else. Um, um, I really want to encourage you to, to really trust that nobody is too sick for you to heal. My God, that sounds like somebody I just heard talking to me a few minutes ago. But nobody is too sick to heal. And they can change, they can come around. But what they need from you, in addition to hearing it from the Bible, is to see it in your face. Your love for them, your love for God, your treasuring of them. And it's, sometimes it's details. Sometimes it's saying, you look thirsty, can I get you a glass of water? I mean, how many times has a therapist ever gotten up to get a client a glass of water? You know, unless they were gagging or something. <laughs> Let alone a cup of tea. So I'm really happy, very, very happy to be here. And that's kind of my end. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> you wouldn't believe where that calls from either. I'm going to turn it off. That's from China. And um, it's... Um, I have to be very careful. I can't say much. Um, but I will turn this thing off. But that was a good interruption. This is from a very Christian person whom I love very much, whom I just stay in touch with a little bit when he's not at Cornell for the summer. Um, by the way, reception from China is amazing. <laughs> um, Now, I, I have not ever used these things, um, and I probably should do it a little bit. So I want to say, f give you four points where you could maybe just, if you want to take notes, this would be where you could actually write down, because I got them set so you could take a brief notes on, some of the, on the essence of what I'm going to tell you about drugs. So if you write in your notepad, psychiatric drugs, colon, and then I'm going to give you four things about psychiatric drugs. First, one, are neurotoxins. Psychiatric drugs are neurotoxins. Two, work by harming the brain. The only way they can work. Parentheses, brain disabling principles. Three, am I going too fast? Three, hide their harmful effects from the recipients. And then you could put in parentheses, medication spellbinding. Hide their harmful effects from the recipients. Medication spellbinding. And four, are dangerous to start or to withdraw from. Like any psychoactive substance, they're going to have their biggest impact when you're starting or stopping or changing the dose. So those are the four principles. And then as a little additions, just there are always better alternatives. And even when people have been harmed by drugs or by other injuries, I also want to say, because I'm talking so much about scientific approach and, to, and, and the brain, um, even when people are injured by psychiatric drugs or shock treatment, which is still done, I'm in a lawsuit right now against a shock manufacturer here in the U.S. Who knew? Well, there's hundreds of thousands of people getting shock treatment in the U.S. That even when you're injured, love, if you can learn to love, you'll have a better life, most likely, than before you were injured. Because if you were injured by psychiatry, it's probable that you were just in a condition where you couldn't love 
or couldn't receive love from anyone, including God or your family. And in that condition, you didn't have much of a life, even if you were a great success on the surface. And once you open your heart to having a loving life, you've probably got enough brain left to have a better life than you did before. Enough good solid brain function. And that's, that's one of the more satisfying things in my practice is I do see a lot of people who are harmed. And um, they do reach a point where they can start having a better life than they did before the harm. Now, um, how did I get into such a position as this? And what does it mean? And I'm going to go through the individual drugs as, as groups. You'll find all of this information in um, my books, which, by the way, I didn't even know they were here, but there's the, probably a room full of my books out there. And there's one book that isn't there. It's called Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. That's a good book for coming off the drugs, psychiatric drug withdrawal, and also for summarizing why you should come off them. I got started in this arena. I had no intention of becoming a physician. Never entered my mind. I thought maybe a psychologist, probably a lawyer. My ideal would be a professor of psychology or American history and literature. And in my first year, a friend of mine, this is a first year at Harvard, asked me to come volunteer at the State Mental Hospital. He said, you know, Peter, you study too much. So um, I went out to the State Mental Hospital. It was a Civil War type looking buildings up on a hill above a small town. Hospitals like this are throughout the Western world. Probably at one point it had held thousands of people, it may, it may have even then. And when I walked into it, just a small group of us at the time, it struck me like my Uncle Dutch's description of liberating a Nazi extermination camp. The stench, the dilapidation, the obvious brutality that people were exposed to, um, the humiliation, the malnutrition. Later I would learn that death rates in state mental hospitals were similar to extermination camps in Europe before the Holocaust, and later I would learn that the Holocaust began with the extermination of mental patients by psychiatrists without Hitler's involvement after Hitler took part. And there's a, a very detailed article by me on my website that you can get um, about uh, the murder of mental patients, very, very documented. And uh, there was general agreement about observers at the Nuremberg trials that the Holocaust might not have taken place uh, if psychiatry hadn't proven the entering wedge and showed that you could pack people on trains and ship them off to extermination centers and that nobody would protest and you could kill them in, in fake showers with fake soap. Psychiatry did it all. And then they burned them in open pits. They hadn't found the gas chambers yet. And they, they didn't have the, uh, the fancy uh, uh, gases. Then they used... Um, truck engines to pipe it into the, in, into the showers, the fake showers. So psychiatry's history is, um, is incredibly bad. Um, and uh, your average psychiatrist didn't even know this history. Um, I gave a lecture on this at the first conference ever on um, uh, medicine in the Third Reich in, in Germany. And they, had, they brought me in all the way from the U.S. to give that talk. Uh, it was so little known. As a slight but very important aside, um, how, can, how can doctors do these things? How can your doctor do these things? How could, uh, it, how could it be, become such a, a thing that human beings would give electroshock to other human beings, lock them up in these horrible places, and even end up calling for euthanasia. We still have that coming up now and again. And, and of course, performing so-called euthanasia in, uh, the, in, in the uh, German hospitals. By the way, they didn't do it to the Jews because they thought the Jews didn't deserve it. 
I mean, that's how incredibly idealistic they were. They're, or at least ideologic. This was something to do to end useless eaters and put them out of their misery. It was be before the extermination of the Jews. Well, it comes back to love again. And I keep wanting to weave that into this without doing theology, to weave it in, to weave it in and out. Because this is what I live by, and it's what you live by, and we could share this even if we have somewhat different ideas at times about it. Um, medical people try to be objective. It is not possible to be objective about other human beings. It's not one of the alternatives given to us by God. We either hate them or love them. We either love one another or we destroy one another. Neutrality is not a human possibility. Now this, I'm, I'm not sure I've heard anyone else talk about this, but I, I don't think it's hardly even discussable. If you look at the people in your office as having an illness when it's a spiritual phenomena, if you look at them as a schizophrenic and not a human being or a bipolar or an ADHD kid, you cannot love them. Or if you try, it's going to be badly distorted. The only way we humans succeed is through love. That is it. And that means embracing the other, everything you've been hearing. I'm so glad I'm here, everything you've been hearing. We embrace human beings with love or we harm them or ignore them, which at times can be harming them. Well, when you're trained in the psychiatric model, you are not even supposed to love your patients. And by love, I don't mean hanging out with them or being romantic with them. I mean what you mean. I mean, you love them from your heart as a, one of God's children. That, you know, instead of looking at a schizophrenic, you, you say to yourself what I s said to myself when I walked in the state mental hospital as a kid, 18-year-old. I looked and I said, my God, dead before the grace of God, go I. I, I knew that as an 18-year-old, I was enough on the edge that if I had a, a worse childhood, that I could have. Anything could have happened to me. That was very clear to me. So the problem you're facing when you even go, and, and it corrupts everybody, it corrupts your pediatrician, it corrupts your internist, it doesn't make them evil, but it corrupts them. When they start offering a drug to you or your kids, they're trying to be objective. They're not loving anymore. Because the loving question would be, what's going on to me, Janie? Mom, Dad, let's get the family together. We all know from the Bible, we all know from common sense and what decent psychology there is, that when a child suffers, the first people we look to to heal is the family, not a pill. Even if Mom and Dad didn't cause the trauma, even if Mom and Dad weren't at fault, I tell this to my patients. I say, you know, when, when mothers and fathers come in and they're expecting me to tell them how bad they are, I say, I'm, well, I'm not even going to look with you at what happened. I've raised children. I don't want to look all the time. I want to look at how we can work together in a loving way to improve love and discipline in the family. Well, if you're not going to do that, if you're not going to embrace the person who comes to you in that manner, you're going to hurt them. You're going to do something stupid, like give them a drug. Giving a 10-year-old, we're giving two-year-old, we're giving infants psychiatric drugs now. You can Google it. It'll make you ill. The first drug, the first great blockbuster drug that ended up being given to tens of millions of psychiatric patients in state mental hospitals and is now being taken by a number of people, probably in this room, were the antipsychotic drugs. The original one was Thorazine, that's still in use. Some of the others, just you know what I'm talking about, are Zyprexa, Risperdal, Risperdal Abilify, Latuda, and Vega. These words don't slip off my mind, I have to remind myself of them. 
Seroquel and Sapris. Um, I'll tell you how they were developed. They were not developed by finding something that would make people happier, give them more free will, enable them to love. A surgeon in Paris in the very early 1950s was looking for a drug and he wanted, he got sent from the drug company, this is the beginning of the big drug companies, a drug that he thought would um, sort of obtune his surgical patients, put them into, quote, hibernation. He had a theory about hibernation because they had a lot of disasters post-surgery and they thought it was from the trauma and they thought that maybe if we could just slow the person down, slow down the person's system, put them in almost into a hibernation, that uh, this might prolong life. So the first drug that he experimented with, his name was Labrid, was chlorpromazine and thorazine. And he noticed the most remarkable thing. The patients didn't care anymore about their condition. It was, it was called indifference. I wish I could say it in French, but I won't even try it. Little, but it was la indifference. Indifference. It would also eventually be called apathy and other more extreme words, which you might get to. The Labyrinth was also had all kinds of interest in psychology. He immediately got in touch in the same facility with two Paris psychiatrist, Delay and Deniker. And within a year, they, were, they had created a giant conference on this drug because Delay and Deniker and a bunch of other people began massively experimenting with it on patients, and the drug companies simultaneously began experimenting with it on animals, including, which we don't do in preparation now in, with the FDA, on higher animals like chimpanzees. And they said, uh, one of them, Delay or Denica, wrote, we knew right away we had really had a great drug because the first day we gave it on the wards, the nurses uniformly said their work was easier. See, from the beginning, it wasn't about the patients. Daniel, Daniel, where are you? You must be here somewhere. Hi. I sit way back like that when I think I might want to leave. Bless you. <laughs> Daniel made that point so well, I had missed it in the DSM-5, how they're talking about how valuable this book, it was written for the, what was it, Daniel, the, the researchers and the clinicians, and you pointed out, wait, 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 wait a minute, I thought it was for the patients. Uh-uh. Now, almost all these patients were women. Even if they had men on the wards, they always preferred to do big things to the women harmful things. That's true about lobotomy. It was true about shock treatment. I spent a few years stopping the return of lobotomy and psychosurgery in the early 70s, and it was such a disproportionate number of women that I got, I got a considerable amount of help from, from women's groups. It was so disproportionate. Now, these women were developing all kinds of weird symptoms. They would grimace, they would stick out their tongues, they would jiggle around. Nobody paid any attention. They were women, crazy women, probably caused by their ovaries or something. They literally, they paid almost no attention. Then one day, DeLay and Deniker got a call from uh, one of the companies that manufactured, well, from the company that was actually manufacturing a, a, a drug very similar Composine, which is still used for nausea in small doses. I wouldn't take it, but in small doses. Um, got a call and they said, we gave this drug to uh, a bunch of young soldiers that we put on ships to see if, who were going on ships, to see if it would prevent nausea. Because these drugs, because of the particular chemo chemistry of them, they also suppress nausea while they suppress the whole human being. And he said, and we're finding they're getting all those weird movements. So now it wasn't women. It was 18, 19, 20-year-old men and boys. 
And that got them thinking. And suddenly, one of them, DeLay or Daneker, I don't love them enough to remember who is who. Sorry. Um, said, I recognize this. We've studied this. This looks just like lethargic encephalitis. Now get that word, lethargic. Indifference. Apathy. It's just like lethargic encephalitis. And he ran off and he went and he researched that lethargic encephalitis was such an interesting disease. There were whole conferences about it. It, it was a disease during World War I, uh, sort of paralleling with, the, with the, the, the flu, much smaller numbers, and it had a characteristic apathy that set in, exactly like sets into every mental patient given the sufficient dose of these drugs today, including Zyprexa and Risperdal, and the ch all the children, everybody getting them. And then they developed neurological disorders. And then they became permanent. They developed psychoses, and they became permanent. They developed dementia. They developed so many of them developed Parkinsonism that a great proportion of Parkinsonism for several decades after was caused by these drugs. Now, for some reason, the newer drugs, the, the, the uh, antipsychotic drugs, don't cause a permanent Parkinsonism usually, but they cause this horrible array of, of abnormal movements called tardive dyskinesia. So DeLay and Deniker now knew and later said, I think they knew at the time, that they were creating a chemical epidemic throughout the Western world of lethargic encephalitis. I mean, I've written papers about this so that you can get them on my website, put in lethargic encephalitis peer-reviewed scientific papers. <laughs> um, what did DeLay and Deniker do when they found out it was a neurotoxin? Because that's what they realized. Because the plague was this particular form of the plague, lethargic encephalitis, was neurotoxic. You, know, you could do autopsies and the people had dead brain cells in areas very similar to where the drugs strike basal ganglia, as well as in the frontal lobes. But it's a very portion of basal ganglia where if you damage it, like in Parkinsonism, movements are changed, you become more apathetic. And then when the brain reacts back, it becomes abnormal excited movements. They bragged about it. And they describe in detail giving women these drugs and reproducing every single symptom of lethargic encephalitis. And that is the drug that supposedly was the great miracle that emptied the mental hospitals. No such thing. It had nothing to do with emptying the mental hospitals. That was a political decision to shift patients off the state role to the federal SSI, which had finally covered mental health. Nothing to do with it, except it allowed you to warehouse the patients. I became heavily involved in this because even in the 70s and 80s when we knew that a huge percentage of patients were getting tardive dyskinesia from the new drugs, and that is still the case, they're getting abnormal permanent movements. The rate is 5 to 8 percent a year cumulative. So by year three, you could have 15 to 24, 5 percent of patients. And that includes, unfortunately, some folks in the audience. And if you're elderly, and I don't mean 82, I mean 55 or 65, because that's where the, the studies were aimed at. They didn't even want to give an 82-year-old drug. They're probably afraid to kill him and wouldn't look good in the study. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> um, well, the rates for folks my age, well, for my age, it'd probably be about 50% a year, cumulative. In other words, I'd get it. For a little younger, those of you who are 60, it's cumulative about 20% a year. Um, one of the, a good book for you to kind of get an overview of this, and one of the less expensive books that's out there, Medication Madness would do that. Um, well, <clears throat> remember Dan Rather? Dan Rather had the biggest uh, TV. I'm going to have to run on this. I'll, I'm giving you the basis. Every drug is like this. Oh, DeLay and Deniker, they called back the drug company, and guess what they said? 
they said, this is amazing. Would you pick your drug that does the most of this neurological stuff? We want to try it on our patients. You see, this is, this is what happens if love is absent and you're, quote, being objective. You become violent in the extreme. And they did that. That drug is still used in Europe today. For some reason, they couldn't get it through the FDA. Believe me, it wasn't benevolent. Something must have gotten messed up. So Dan Rather's uh, producer came to me in the 1980s, early 80s, and said, we want to do a show on psychiatry. You, you've been stopping lobotomy around the world. That would be a great show. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, there was a horror going on called Tardive Dyskinesia. I want you, would you think about that? And I told him about it, and I gave him a book manuscript. I said, this is my book manuscript. It's going to come out in the next few months. And he did a whole show on this, and a whole hour. And um, the FDA, as a result, put a lot more in the drug label for tardive dyskinesia. And you know what effect it's had on his medical profession? Nothing. You know, if you think of it, if you get into my model that this is an abuse, what happens if you confront an abusive man? Especially if you do it in public, you say, Hey, hey, man, don't grab your son like that. When he gets home, he'll beat the hell out of the kid. You embarrassed me. So that's what psychiatry does. We call him on something, my colleagues on something, they just try to do it more. We'll show you. All right, the second blockbuster drug was the 60s, the benzodiazepines, mother's little helper. Um, in a word, it's an anesthetic. When, when the doc puts you out and operates on you, he's giving you one of these drugs. So why does it, quote, work for um, patients who are anxious? Well, anxiety is like one of the highest human qualities. It, it's, it's, it requires intact functioning. And so if you suppress overall brain function, that is, you start giving anesthesia, low level, enough you'd still walk around and carry on your work, low enough level, one of the first things that you'll notice is you're not having much more anxiety. You know, maybe it's gone for a while. But it doesn't work. And this brings us into another principle, which is that psychiatric drugs are not welcomed by the brain. The brain fights back. So on any psychiatric drug, you're going to go up and down. One of the ways the brain fights back, for example, with the antipsychotic drugs, the antipsychotic drugs are trying to give you a slowdown. Brain fights back and says, no, 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 I'm jacking up, I'm jacking up. You jack up those parts of the brain and you get abnormal movements, you get psychosis. Brain fighting back. Well, the brain fights back against the benzos. It actually causes a heavy addictions and um, withdrawal problems. All psychiatric drugs do this because the brain fights them, doesn't like them. And by the way, um, the way all psychiatric drugs are studied are on the animals. So that shows you it's got nothing to do with human beings. It has nothing to do with love, nothing to do with anxiety, nothing to do with relationship. They look and they say, okay, this drug is making it harder for the rat to turn back over when we flip them over. That might be a good antipsychotic drug. I'm not kidding you. And they study the brain, and if they can show it's ruining one of your neurotransmitters, they advertise it as a drug that's going to correct it. And that brings us to Prozac, another big blockbuster. I was heavily involved in that. I was the medical psychiatric expert for a combined uh, maybe 150 cases against the drug company. You know what they did? They fixed the trial, the first big trial. That's, that's why you have Prozac today. And there's a, I have a long section on that in Medication Madness. Lots of quotations from the judges and everybody. It was a very well known afterwards as a fix. But the only thing the newspapers carried was the original victory by the drug company, not the fix. I, I figured out it was fixed during the trial. Ginger told me three months earlier 
She says, oh, he's fixed. I said, what do you mean? The lawyer you're supposed to be working for never talks to you. He hasn't sent you anything in six months. You're doing all the research on your own. That's not what usually happens. I said, yeah, but I can't be fixed. Maybe he's stupid. It wasn't. And that was a very short summary, but there's a real lot of detail in medication madness. Um, Prozac was so harmful to the normal, the dozen or so normal students or whatever they were that was tried on initially, that the man in charge of it said, we can't make this a first-line drug, it causes too much overstimulation, too much anxiety, too many other problems, and um, they fired him. They got a guy who would promote it as a first-line drug. When I was, when I was uh, doing all this work for the, you know, I was the scientist for like, I don't know, 150, 180 suits or whatever. Uh, I talked to a man in the FDA who was um, in charge of evaluating the dangers of the drug. And he told me he recognized right away that it had uh, amph amphetamine, cocaine-like problems to it. It was overstimulating people. And, but he couldn't get the FDA to put anything in the label about it. Overstimulating somebody who's depressed is likely to lead to, to suicide, violence, or some other aberration because that poor suffering human being is suddenly being jacked up and doesn't know what's happening. Stimulant drugs. And there's books on stimulant drugs out there and so on. I was the expert on, uh, well, M NIMH was going to have a um, National Institute of Mental Health, a big conference on um, ADHD and its treatment. And the office that, that is directing above that, it was the National Institute of Health, realized they didn't have anybody critical of the drugs. There wasn't even going to be a guy reporting on adverse drug effects in a conference organized by our mental health agency on ADHD and treatment, so they had brought me in. <laughs> Imagine how happy that made them at NIMH. And so I started researching it, and the first thing I discovered is it was all this animal research on how it worked. So I said, I want to also give, I called back the head of the conference, I said, I want to talk about adverse effects and how it works. She said, we don't know how it works. I said, yes, we got a ton of animal research. She said, no, there's no animal research. I mean, this is how it works. What are those words you've been using all day long about untruth and dishonesty. And so, what I found out was that for reasons well, we have some chemical idea about, but it's so vague, stimulant drugs we give our children suppress spontaneity and cause OCD. So if little Jimmy is um, jumping around too much, you know, that's one of the symptoms of ADHD. Or if he squirms in his seat, it's another symptom of ADHD. There's no such thing as ADHD. It's just kids. And, and some of them are more, and some of them are less, and some of them are being beaten, and some of them are happy. They're kids. And they're on a big, wide range of behaviors. It's no disease, nothing, period, zip. Um, but all children, <laughs> thank you, all children, all animals, all adults, the initial result of taking these drugs is to separate you from humanity. All these drugs cut you off from other people in one way or another. And in this case, Jimmy don't care about Janie anymore. And why does Jimmy, looking at the board and writing things down, he's got OCD, he's not learning a thing. Do you know that after all these years, after NIMH paying millions of dollars to old boys clubs to do tons of research showing how these drugs help children, they have only proven it stunts growth? And it stunts growth not just by suppressing appetite, as your average physician thinks, it suppresses growth hormone, my God. What is, disrupts the whole growth hormone cycle. What is that doing to the whole human being? And it only works for, only suppresses for a few weeks because the brain fights back. So then the kid ends up on 
sleeping pills because he can't sleep. He ends up on anti-anxiety drugs because he's getting nervous. And follow-up studies, we have them. The kids from the 70s who had mild hyperactivity in class and none at home are now statistically significantly more obese, more time in jail, more time in mental hospitals, more, more suicide, everything worse, all the worst things you can imagine. So why is that? It's not because of the stimulants. That was the gateway drug, like marijuana. They don't even, they weren't even on stimulants in their 40s. What are they on now? Everything else. Because it became a career of being drugged. So I've covered the stimulants, I've covered a little bit. Uh, you know, why, do, why do people keep coming back to these drugs? Because they do blunt emotions. And the stimulants and the um, antidepressants often cause a euphoria. Because there's two things that happen when you get a blow on the head. You either go, ugh, and you're like in a daze, or you get a little euphoric. <laughs> you know, you're silly. It's called euphoria. Well, God forbid, the worst thing that can happen to you if you take an antidepressant is to get a week of euphoria. Because it means you go searching and searching and searching to get a good effect again. Or worse, it's the beginning of mania because the drugs cause mania. And they do cause violence. I'll talk about that maybe when I'm done talking here. Um, so all the drugs work by disabling the brain. Lithium was the other magic bullet. I don't know if many of you are old enough to remember when NIMH held press conferences. Lithium was the first magic bullet for treating mania. Well, if they had read the American Medical Association Journal, they would have found out it was a neurotoxin because it was put in salt shakers as a substitute for salt a few decades earlier and was killing people. Or if they had looked at the research on animals where it began, the guy who did it was Cade, and he, a psychiatrist, and he was studying something about renal function, and he gave lithium to, the, to some guinea pigs, and they all flaked out. And what did he think to himself? He's a psychiatrist. He thought, my God, I can't wait to try it on these mental patients who are out of control. So he went across the street and started drugging everybody. Magic bullet to flatten anybody he was given to. It's a universal toxin. That is, I mean, it just, it, it just gums up so much in the brain. And, and all these drugs have characteristic neurotoxicities where when you really get near death's door, there's their own characteristic neurotoxic patterns. And you'll find all of that in textbooks of neurotoxicity, but very little in the psychiatric textbooks, needless to say. Um, well, I'm kind of winding down. Let me take a breath. The, um, a concept that, that I published a few, so I think in 2010, this medication spellbinding. I published it in medical journals under the technical term of intoxication ag anosognosia. It means not knowing you're intoxicated. You know all the years drunk friends don't let, drunks don't let their friends drive drunk? All that kind of, have you ever tried to stop a drunk friend from driving? I mean, I tried with the help of a young woman I was with at the time to stop another young woman from getting in her car because she couldn't get her key in in a parking lot. And we, within minutes, we were surrounded by her and five drunk companions who were going to beat the hell out of us for interfering. People who are intoxicated, whether it's on marijuana, routinely, I mean, if one of you, two of you, I wouldn't expect a lot of you to be smoking dope in this group, but if you are, <laughs> you don't know that, it's, that it is not helping you find God. It is suppressing your highest functions, like every drug does. They all cross the blood-brain barrier. They all hit the glorious frontal lobes that we have, that no animal has anything nearly like it. And that's what goes first, is, is relationships, love, caring. And in an odd way I can't fully explain, people who are on intoxicants rarely appreciate how intoxicated they are. And in fact, people who are brain damaged, maybe it's a gift from God. People who are brain damaged don't know how damaged they are. 
this is a characteristic. Um, somewhere along the way, Alzheimer patients have no idea how damaged they are. Um, and this is one of the things that my dastardly colleagues use all the time. I mean, routinely in America today, millions of people are walking into psychiatrist offices like this. They can't even tell them how bad they feel or that they can't move or that they're disabled now by the drugs, and the psychiatrist keeps drugging them. It's usually the families at that stage that stop the drugs. I remember one father, this is not a bad thing to end on, um, one father who came to me, again as a last resort, very wealthy man, he um, had taken, his daughter had stopped communicating with him. She was in graduate school. And, and that summer, she'd been home, he loved her, she loved him very much. Um, she was relatively slender, an ace at uh, tennis, they loved playing tennis, they had, she had a great sense of humor. And she stopped communicating, so he came up to find her. And he gets into her apartment, and it's a pigsty, and then he sees her. She's not recognizable. She's obese. She's expressions flat. And she doesn't care, apathy, indifference. This is what they all do. Long-term alcohol, long-term marijuana, um, and psychiatric drugs immediately. Uh, they, they cause this indifference, this, they, they reduce the engagement with life. So he took her first to her, the, the star uh, um, a psychiatrist in, in psychopharmacology at one of our medical schools, I was in D.C. at the time, and he said, no, she's on Zyprexa, this is the latest, best drug, no, there's no problem here. Keep her on it. I don't even know if he asked what it was been bothering. Uh, the young woman had had terrible nightmares and sleepwalking. Serious? No reason to believe that Prex is going to help him. So then they took her to NIMH. And he got exactly the same thing. And he spent time with them. And this man was commanding. I mean, you'd listen to him faster as you'd listen to Ed, I'll tell you. Maybe faster even. Ed's gentle. This guy was upset. And then he brings it to me. And to his huge relief, I look at him and I look at her and I say, oh my God, you know, what's happened to you? And she can't even respond. So I say to her, you know, your dad's been taking you to all these different doctors and I'm not being mean to dad at all. I'm, I'm already looking at him like he's a godsend. Um, and, um, and, and I say to her, do you want to be here? You don't even look like you want to be here. She says, I don't want to be dragged around to any more doctors. I said, do you realize that you are drugged literally out of your mind? No. And that's what's going on. That's what's going on. The stricken father, as he'd done with two, maybe three, who, I don't know how many more of the docs. I just remember these outstanding ones at NIMH, and I think it was Georgetown brings out pictures of her from four months earlier. Five, he'd show these same pictures to everybody else. Bright, smiling, together youngster. Well, I got her off the Zyprexa, and um, I worked with Dad on the phone. And he came in sometimes. And, you know, I had a, this was at the start of Zyprexa, so it was years ago, and she did fine. Occasionally did Dad or she writes to me. Um, this is a horror story. So we go back to, uh, I want to end on the idea of love. Um, um, we have to approach the people around us um, as if they're God's children. They are. We have to see their spirit. We have to radiate love and caring for them. And um, as counselors, never forget the power you're giving through God, through Jesus, don't forget the power of you loving, because if that person can begin to think, wow, it's possible to be happy. And, and, and people do get better. They don't get better when they go to a psychiatrist or an internist or a, 
a nurse practitioner who is sitting. Believe me now, they'll, they, they'll be, they even sit behind desks and type on their computers. I get up, I walk out, and then you should do this. Don't, don't have your patient come into your office, you know. You go out, you welcome them, you see who's with them, you smile, tell them you're really glad to meet them, you ask them if they'd like anything, like they make it easy here, do they get easy? You, you greet them. Greet them like they're a well-armed prince and princess. Really greet them like they matter. And don't get lost in reading from the Bible. Can I say that? Don't get lost in it. S engage in it. Really communicate it to the people with your heart. Because they're going to hear your heart, maybe before the words. They'll see who you are and how radiant you are about, about the experience. And if you do that, you will never have burnout. I am 82 years old in a minute, <laughs> minute overtime. And I can tell you, I've never burned out. I burn out every day I'm working with lawyers. I burn out every day and going in courtrooms and having judges jerk us all around. I burn out. I do that because I have instructions to do it. I have never gotten up in the morning and been distressed about seeing my best friends, the people I love, my family, and then I go to my clients. So. Bring, bring that to your work, you know, work in love all the time, and you, you will thrive, and so the people you greet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.